Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Warm welcome back to this, which is the uh, Carrick, um, Carrick Online uh, Road Safety Engineering Pedestrian Safety Online Workshop. I uh, hope you had a good weekend and a warm welcome back to this, our third module, which is focusing on safer pedestrian facilities. A reminder, as always, that we do have interpretation available for you. Please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom application, and you can select Russian translation there if you require it. So at the bottom of your screen, please select interpretation. And as always a reminder, please don't hesitate to write in any questions, comments into our chat or Q&A functions. We will also be asking you to answer a few questions today. So keep that in mind. But of course, anything else comes to mind, please do let us know. A reminder as well, this Carrick Road Safety Engineering online workshop is being conducted under the framework of the Carrick program. And this workshop is sponsored by the Asian Development Bank's Knowledge and Support Technical Assistance titled Enhancing Road Safety for Central Asia Regional Economic Corporation Member Countries phase two. So a big thanks, of course, to those who are making this workshop possible. Uh, today, we will, of course, be moving, as I mentioned, into our third module focusing on safer pedestrian facilities with our lead facilitator, Phil Jordan from Road Safety International, who you can already see there on screen. But just before we do start, I just wanted to give a brief reminder about our first homework assignment. So Pilar, if you have that slide there ready, thank you so much. Uh, so just a reminder for everybody that um, the homework assignment, uh, which uh, you were given last week, is due by uh, close of business today. And you can see there the email address that you can submit your homework to. And maybe I could ask that Pilar or Marianne put that email address again in the chat box. Uh, so just a reminder, that is due by the end of today. That will allow Phil to provide some feedback on it as soon as possible in one of these sessions. Uh, so just a reminder of that. Uh, we hope that those who are have done it or are completing it, uh, that you are going well and everything was clear. Uh, as we mentioned last week, not a big task, but rather just one to uh, hopefully explore some of the different topics that we have been focusing on to date in this series. So again, a reminder for submission of homework into that email address you can see on the screen by close of business today. That can be in English or in Russian. Uh, with the Russian, just please ensure you submit as a Word document, not as a PDF. That way we can easily translate. We will also be having details on our second assignment, small assignment, um, at the close of today's session. So please do ensure that you stay tuned for that information where we will um, get that information about the second small activity that you will have to really help to understand the practical implementation of the knowledge that is being covered right throughout this pedestrian safety online workshop series. Okay, so again, a reminder, our interpretation is again available into Russian please just use the button at the bottom of the Zoom application. And as always, don't hesitate to use the chat or Q&A for any questions or comments and keep an uh, eye out for, for or, or listening for us where we will also pose a few questions that you can respond in that chat box as well during today's session. Okay, with that, I'm going to now pass over to our lead facilitator, Phil Jordan who is going to explore safer pedestrian facilities in specific. He's going to be talking through aspects covered in chapters five and six of the pedestrian safety manual, uh, which by now you should be well aware of. And again, we're encouraging you to use and access in your ongoing work. So with that, let me pass over to Phil for his presentation. And Phil, just a reminder again for the sharing of sound as you share your screen. <laughs> Thank you, Blaze. I just double checked that. That's why I jumped in and out of the uh, sharing of sound. Uh, I'd like to say good morning 
Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and maybe even good night to everybody who is online for this workshop. It's great to have you back with us. We are working our way slowly but surely through the fourth manual in the Carrack Road Safety Engineering series. And today we've got heaps of slides that I'm gonna do my best to explain to you what chapters five and six are all about in the manual. And it's all about providing safer facilities. Now, Shiva, I hope Shiva's online, um, made a mention he was looking forward to counting Wally the Wombat signs. So as a special request, we brought Wally the Wombat out of retirement and we're putting him into action. For those of you that don't know Wally the Wombat, he is an Australian marsupial closely related to the koala. And wherever you see this warning sign, that is a warning sign in the American slash Australian standard convention. This is not quite a conventional wombat, but this is a warning sign and it's Wally the Wombat. So wherever you see that on a slide, if you wish, just keep count. And at the end of the evening or the day, whichever time zone you are in, we'll ask you to tell me how many Wally the Wombat signs you've seen. Okay, so that one's number one. I'll give you a hint. And as I said, we want you to count all of these that you see. Some will be big, some will be tiny. It's to keep you awake. So there is a ulterior motive in what we do. So that fella there is number two. Let's see how, how many we see for the day. So welcome back. To all of you, thank you, Blaze, for the introduction. Thank you to the interpreters. Uh, as I've said before, our job as engineers is to make the roads as safe as practicable. We work with the road and we need to put the road into road safety. And you can save lives. And in particular, in this workshop, we are talking about pedestrians' lives. So throughout uh, today, I want you to remember that uh, basically speed is closely uh, linked to pedestrian uh, safety. I want you to remember that pedestrians are legitimate road users. I want you to think about the facilities you currently provide for pedestrians. Now I've been to just about every one of the Karak countries. I've only just walked across the border into Afghanistan. I've done projects in Afghanistan, but haven't spent days there. I have been to, I think every other one. And I've seen pedestrian facilities. Some are quite impressive. Some are not well maintained. Some are old school. Some ignore the pedestrians overall. And what I would love to do is to have you go away from here um, somewhat enthused to try out some new devices. Now, I know that this will require funding. I'm not uh, naive enough to know that we can change the world without funds in one day. But some of you will go on into very senior positions in your ministries, in your departments, in your career. And I hope that you might just remember some of the key messages from this workshop. And one of them, one of them will be to use more push button signals to help pedestrians to cross the roads. And if possible, introduce this type of crossing called a puffin crossing. We'll go into a little detail about that later. And right now, in the cities throughout Carrick, in Dushan Bay, Tashkent, Samarkand, uh, Ashgabat, uh, Ulaanbaatar, and many, many others, Almaty, Nusultan, et cetera, et cetera. You can be introducing a whole package, a whole program of low cost civil works, which will really help the pedestrians. It will focal, focus the pedestrians to a crossing point. And these are really low cost and low maintenance. 
But today is going to focus on these issues. Active time separation, passive time separation. It's a fine point, but we'll explain the difference. We'll try and cover a little bit about safe intersections for pedestrians, particularly, of course, signalised intersections. And the small scale civil works that I've just touched on, they will be discussed in a bit more detail. Now, before we jump into those, uh, there's a few, few issues that have popped up from last Thursday. Now, my, my colleague in Tanzania, Laurent, and a colleague, I'm guessing from the name, could be from Georgia, but I'm not sure, Ramazi, and both asked about how much of all of this whole problem, I'll call it a pedestrian problem, how much of it is to do with engineering and how much is it to do with pedestrian and driver behaviour when it comes to addressing pedestrian safety? Now, it's a tough question. If I say it's totally pedestrians problem, they're the problem, they're the ones that cause the problem, then that gives engineers, like all of us, it gives us an excuse to wash our hands and walk away and do nothing. We must never do that. And so I will address you to the safe system. And we've brought the safe system into the workshop. It got mentioned right back at the start. Uh, David spoke about it on Tuesday of last week. I've touched on it. And the safe system is an important philosophy and it helps to guide you in your thinking. The elements of pedestrians versus the road and the facilities, very important. The system expects the users to comply with all of the road rules and to look after their own well-being. We cannot possibly accept a system that has uh, any road user just ignoring the rules and being ill-advised on their behaviour. But at the same time, the road managers like the ministries of transport, the Carrick departments of uh, roads and traffic and safety, they have a responsibility to put forward devices that are going to serve the users, not simply to ignore the pedestrians, or even I've seen worse cases, they don't just not help them, but they restrict their movements. And I'll perhaps leave Blaze to have a, a one minute input if he wishes about uh, answering that question. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Phil. And uh, uh, look, I'd say that it's certainly a question that comes up very often, uh, both in, in trainings or capacity building workshops where we're focusing on infrastructure, but also vice versa, when we have workshops that focus on uh, impacting behaviour uh, and, and uh, un trying to kind of understand where the, um, I guess, the, um, where, where people need to take responsibility and where the system needs to take responsibility in terms of protect, protecting pedestrians. So really, I think it's, it's echoing Phil's point that the system uh, gives us the answer for this. And it really does outline that there is a need to, for sure, for engineers to play a role and to, to be able to create um, roads and pedestrian facilities that allow for pedestrians to not have to be too constrained to go about the things that they need to do, to not have to push them too far out of the way of vehicles. Um, but at the same time, there is a need, of course, to ensure that we are educating and enforcing um, people so that they are also able to comply and also to be able to do their part in terms of protecting themselves as pedestrians, but also, of course, for drivers, um, whether it be of uh, powered uh, two wheelers or of uh, vehicles, uh, to ensure that they are best placed to not put uh, pedestrians uh, under undue um, risk. So I would also just add to that, that in the session this Thursday, we will, I think, further showcase the importance of these parts working together by introducing some of the non-engineering issues relating to pedestrian safety. So we'll have presentations on enforcement and on education. And this will be from organisations um, that, that have expertise in those areas, 
but that both work on global programs that combine enforcement and community engagement with engineering solutions. So, so that these are people that aren't just going to talk about um, the behavioural aspects alone, but rather will showcase how they need to be addressed in concert, in combination with um, many of the aspects that Phil has talked about uh, so far and will talk about today. So uh, I guess that's just a few thoughts to add in there, Phil. Cheers, back to you. Thank you, Blaise. And uh, thank you, Laurent and Ramazi for, for those questions. Now, I also had a little bit of a glitch on Thursday with the sound for this video. I hope I've clicked the right button. This is a video about the difference that five kilometers in an operating speed can make before a crash. So I hope you can hear the sound. Let's listen to this. It's an advertisement in English. Our Russian interpreters will be able to help you with that. What you're about to see will change your mind about speeding. Two identical cars, one travelling at 60, the other at 65. A sudden change in the road ahead. And both drivers first react and then, a moment later, they brake. And things start to get interesting. Down here, the difference is extraordinary. In the last five metres of braking, you wipe off half your speed. So this car is still doing 32 k's when it hits. This one also hits, but only at five k's. So no matter how good a driver you are, five k's difference up there makes 27 k's difference down here. The simple message, and it took me many times watching that video to, to fully understand it, but there's a couple of key messages. And one of them that Ian Johnson says, in the last five meters of braking, you wipe off half of your speed, half of your original speed. And that's critical. Uh, it makes a big difference to the impact speed. Impact speeds are what are critical in the safe system. Impact speeds are what fundamentally are the difference between life and death when a pedestrian is struck. Uh, I'm happy to take questions anytime and we're gonna push on and try to get through lots and lots of exa examples here in this presentation, leading into one pedestrian black spot that we will set for your homework and hopefully you might uh, want to return a page about your thoughts on how to best handle this Carrack Highway pedestrian black spot in a big Carrack city. When you think about pedestrians, they either want to cross the road like this gentleman in Riyadh, or they want to walk along the road. And our job is to help them. And sometimes, too often I'm afraid in Carrack, I've seen cases where good engineers have been determined to help pedestrians, but sometimes have not given any real help, even with the best of intentions. And in the worst case, possibly could set up the pedestrian for serious um, injury. This one is on the A380 in one of my favorite countries, Uzbekistan. It's a painted zebra crossing in a gap in the with a gap in the barrier across at least four, arguably six lanes of highway traffic traveling at more than 100 kilometers per hour. And I would not put a zebra crossing in such a place. Engineers like us should be asking serious questions because I know we all want to help the pedestrian. No question about that. Will a crossing help the pedestrian or not? If it's going to help, what, what type is best? And will the pedestrians and will the drivers comply? Will the police occasionally enforce? Sometimes my experience tells me we are better to not put something in and maybe look for 
pedestrian refuges. In this case, there was a, a very narrow median, which serves the same. Maybe curb extensions, maybe some low cost, small scale civil works. This is an example that uh, I think I've shown you on other occasions. Um, and the, you can't quite see behind the, the, the Russian wording here, but there is a zebra crossing, high speed highway in Kazakhstan. I urge all of you to not put what we commonly call zebra crossings on high speed roads or on roads with more than a single direction of traffic, single lane of traffic in each direction is what I'm trying to say. Uh, here we go, this is the one in Uzbekistan on the A380. And this one is also Uzbekistan and a big wide road in Tashkent. So the bottom line, uh, and it's easy for me to say, but the reality is never put a zebra on a high speed road. No one's going to stop for the pedestrian and never allow a zebra to go across multiple lanes because the second, third or fourth lane, the overtaking driver may not see the pedestrian. So just think, go back to our logic. Why do we install such, such crossings? In a perfect world, a zebra crossing is a low cost device that is one part of the highway network or the road network on which pedestrians have right of way over the motor traffic. That's the only reason we put up a sign and we paint the road. It's to say in this little part of the whole road system, if there's a pedestrian there, he or she is king. They have right of way. Drivers, you must give way to them. Now, in too many carrot countries and at too many zebra crossings, drivers do not give way. So we need better police enforcement. But at the same time, even a well-intentioned driver cannot be expected to stop from 100 kilometers per hour without fear of being rammed in the back. And the overtaking driver here on this wide uh, crossing in Tashkent, even with the best of intentions, may not see the walking pedestrian. So think carefully and please, sometimes it's better to not give them anything. And of course, if you have volumes of pedestrians and something must be done, that's where your challenge comes in. And I suggest that's where we start to look at um, more substantial crossings than the humble zebra. Okay. And that's what this presentation is really about. And I've had uh, the great honor of traveling many times into the Carrick region. And there were some of those occasions that stand out. And this was one of them. Um, some of you from uh, Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek, will recognize this crossing. I was told when we were standing there with ministry people, the crossing had had 17 fatalities in a single year. Now, if that's true, if it's anywhere near true, that's just one of the worst sites that I have ever come across in my entire career. So, What's unsafe about it? It's crossing six lanes of a Carrick Highway. I think the speed zone was, might be 60, but I think at night, operating speeds, oh, 80, 90. And to have 17 deaths in one year, uh, absolutely unacceptable by anyone's standards. So the zebra had been there for many years. The time had come to really get rid of that black spot. And this is the sort of thing that um, too often happens around the world. You've heard from the first day that there are approximately, as best as we know, 400,000 pedestrian deaths on the roads of the world every year. More than 1,000 deaths every day, pedestrians. My office, when I had a project, a big World Bank project in Tehran, it was over looking a very busy and modestly high-speed arterial road close to the center of Tehran. 
We heard a crunch one day. I looked out the window and I saw there'd been a crash. This young lady was the driver of this small vehicle. An elderly gentleman who had been crossing from the other side of the road had stepped onto this 1.2 metre wide median, had then stepped off and sadly had misjudged and stepped into the path of this small vehicle driven by this young lady. The man is down here on the ground going into shock. When I went down, this gentleman is down there and to this day, I still don't know how he fared, whether he survived or not. I was very concerned for his well-being. But this is a little but yet clear example of the um, kinematics of a pedestrian collision. When a pedestrian is struck by a motor vehicle, they tend not to be run over, which is a funny term in English. We talk about a motor car running over a pedestrian. They actually run under them. And the pedestrian's legs get struck, the pedestrian's head, etc., being quite heavy, gets thrown onto the bonnet of the car. Or if the car is going fast and faster and faster, sometimes the head hits the windscreen, the windshield. In this case, I believe that is the man's shoulder impact. I believe that's the man's head. And I suspect, and the police who investigate detail uh, crashes like this, they could tell you roughly the speed this young woman was going. And I suspect it was probably about 70 or so kilometers an hour in a busy time in a busy street. Speed and pedestrian safety go hand in hand. And our good friend Wally is showing up. So keep counting. I think I've lost score already. So you've got issues crossing the road. You've got issues walking along the road. Let's try and deal with the walking along the road first if we can. Uh, at least to flag a few things, we're kind of jumping backwards and forwards. When we're helping pedestrians in rural areas, to me, the best way to do it is through paved shoulders. The further we can keep the reasonable pedestrians like these ladies, the further we can keep them from the moving traffic, the better for all. If we have enough room and enough money to create a separate footpath, some all weather footpath that's well away from the road, that's wonderful, go for it. My experience tells me that that is still relatively rare around the world. And indeed, much of my time when I'm doing road safety audits and when I'm liaising with government uh, ministries about new road projects, I keep pushing for a 1.5 metre wide paved shoulder because paved shoulders have got many benefits. And one of the benefits is helping pedestrians to have an all weather uh, route away from the traffic. The further away, the better, but I'll accept a paved shoulder. Now, I showed this slide the other day, just keep this in mind. As, uh, as we go. There are some basic rules with expressways, with high speed highways, with absolute controlled uh, access, i.e. interchanges. There is no way you want to put crossings across the road. And there's no way you want pedestrians walking along the road. We have to keep the pedestrians totally away from those expressways. That means you have grade separation across the top, and you need totally separate paths right outside the fenced areas for pedestrians, cyclists and others. On arterial roads, as you move down this, this um, diagram down here, you have to start thinking of all options. Arterial roads can be rural or urban. Mostly the pedestrian problems are urban, but not totally. Collector roads, you need to start to think about how we might separate in terms of space with things like uh, refuge islands. And in local streets, traffic calming and small civil works might be your best option. You probably will not need 
zebra crossings or puffins or formal crossings if you can manage the speed and funnel the pedestrians. Now, Gulistan has raised a hand. I'm happy to take a question if we can uh, unmute Gulistan. Is that possible? Yes, I've just done that, Phil. I'm not sure whether it was an um, inadvertent raise hand or not. So uh, Gulistan, please do go ahead if you have a question that you would like to raise. We might return to Gulistan if okay. indeed there is a question from Gulistan Phil, so I'll let you know. That, that's fine. Um, happy to take that question anytime. So the issue of crossing the road, and, and as I'm looking at this presentation, I realise I've got lots of uh, Uzbekistan photos in there. Do we have anyone online from Uzbekistan at the moment? If we have, um, say hi in the chat box. Uh, wonderful country, and I hope the summer has been kind to you. And uh, to all of you, happy for me, it's a winter solstice tonight. Uh, for most of you, it's going to be a summer solstice. So you've got a long day, oh, I've got a long night. And in the chat box, uh, no, that's a different, <laughs> different one, right. So here we are, we're in Uzbekistan, crossing the road. The things to think about, grade separation. Will we go over the road or under the road? Do we rely on a median? Do we rely on pedestrian refuges and curb extensions? These are the things that give spatial separation. They separate the pedestrian from the motor vehicle in, in distance, space. Then we come to time separation. These things separate the motor vehicle from the pedestrian in time. Zebra crossings, which as a purist, as a traffic engineer, I still like to call them pedestrian crossings, but the uh, common term is zebra. Then we have pedestrian signals, which are fixed time. I'm being very pedantic and pure here. Then we have pedestrian operated signals, POS. These ones are operated by the pedestrian by pushing a button. And I want to see more of these across Carrick, please, please. These ones must eventually replace the simple old fixed time PED signals. Then you can have variations on this one, on the pedestrian operated signals. You can have a pelican crossing, a puffin crossing, a toucan crossing. You can have a part-time crossing, as I showed the other day, a school crossing with flags. And of course, most of the Carrick countries have got many intersection signals. And those intersection signals can and must be better for the pedestrians in due course. So we're going to try and cover all of those in the coming hour and 20 minutes or thereabouts. So keep the questions coming. I've got some simple messages for you. I'm happy to try and discuss within the limits of technology. And I'll say this, I don't have all of the answers to all of the, the pedestrian problems of the world, but please do not think that footbridges are going to be the answer to every problem you have. In fact, they will be generally a great disappointment. So when you're designing the next ADB funded road project leading from your capital city out into the provinces that go through towns that uh, will interfere with the safety of pedestrians, school kids going to school, don't automatically think an overpass, a footbridge will be your answer. You have to think about a much bigger issue and that could involve things which you've never done before. Traffic calming, speed restrictions, push button signals, even some road narrowings, etc. in the villages. In a perfect world, you would take a bypass around the village. But don't go thinking footbridges are the answer. 
They are the only option if you are dealing with an expressway. They are suitable when you've got particularly high speeds and or high traffic volumes. And because of that, your pedestrians are delayed excessively. And particularly if your pedestrian demand is focused at one given point. If you've got pedestrians crossing a road over several kilometers, they're not going to walk that far to get to one footbridge. If you do have a really serious pedestrian crash problem, for whatever reason, um, a school, a medical centre exists in a semi-rural area, high speeds, etc. If you've had a crash problem and the previous uh, points apply, you might consider a footbridge. And of course, if you're lucky enough to be in a big city where you've got big high-rise buildings, you can sometimes take pedestrians from one building to another on the first, second, third, fourth floor without going down to the ground level. That's very rare in Carrack, unless you tell me otherwise, I don't think I've seen it in Carrack. But if you want to come here to Melbourne, I'll take you into the little streets in the back streets of Melbourne. And this is one of our biggest department stores. You can walk from, I think it's the first floor to the first floor in this building and there's other uh, overpasses up above this as well. So you stay dry, you stay warm, you don't go down and mix with the motor vehicles. Molly the Wombat doesn't want you to do that. Now, the other thing is, they are, these footbridges are normally not appropriate where the volumes and the speeds are not high enough to cause pedestrians great delay. You know what it's like. You, all of you, I'm sure, have crossed many busy roads without any help from a pedestrian facility. You look for a gap, you judge the speed, you walk across, you might have to run across at times, you take care not to trip, you hope you don't have little kids with you and you try, you try not to set a bad example for your family. But the bottom line is many, many times the speeds and the volumes are not high enough to really delay or upset the pedestrian. I know uh, a, a footbridge won't normally work in that case. You know, it won't work if your pedestrian demand is dispersed over a big length of road. They won't work if pedestrians perceive that it's going to be too long in either time or distance to walk to the footbridge, climb up, I'll say 36 steps, walk across the road, come down 36 steps and then walk to the destination. Pedestrians are not fools and they can do the arithmetic quickly in their mind and it's what they perceive. If there is a median on the road, pedestrians know because we've already explained the Poisson theory and the need for pedestrian refuges, they know that a median is one big pedestrian refuge. And even though they may not understand all of what I'm just talking about, they know they only have to pick a safe gap in one direction, stand on the median, pick a safe gap in the second direction, and they will get across generally with a much reduced delay compared to undivided roads. If you have disabled pedestrians, you've got to provide for them, no, no excuses. We need ramps, we need elevators, etc. And to do that, the mechanisms have to be well maintained. The further from the capital cities you are, the less likely it is to have good, clean, well-maintained overpasses like this one or underpasses. There's good and bad examples all over the world. Some Phil, of them... sorry, sorry, Phil, just before you move on, and I'm, yes, I'm assuming you might uh, get to this as you go along, but a question here from Laurent, he's, 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 he's actually referring specifically, I guess, to, to some of the things you're talking about here, which is uh, that, that underpasses and overpasses might, might not be right in many instances. And so right. his, his question is what, what other uh, options engineers might consider? Uh, Laurent, you're just a little bit early with the question. I'm going to come to that. 
And I'll, I'll answer it now, but it needs a lot more explanation. If there is a device needed, you either put in push button signals or a puff and crossing, which is almost the same, or you put in a pedestrian refuge. It depends on the road, whether it's divided or not. If it's undivided, a refuge island can help. Curb extensions, depending on the curbside lane of the road, curb extensions can help pedestrians to get a better view of traffic in an urban, particularly an urban environment. And there are situations where zebra crossings are appropriate, but speeds and width of roads are very critical. So I'm sorry, this is a convoluted answer. But that's why this presentation goes for another hour. We try to flesh all of this out. If I don't do the job properly, Laurent, you come back to me in about 45 minutes, okay? Right. If you are going to ever consider a footbridge, you have to provide for the disabled. And this one appears to have a small uh, elevator. It's not covered, so when it rains, when it snows, when it's 40 degrees, you're exposed. Nothing to stop kids dropping all sorts of things on the cars below. And this one, it's funny, it's covered on the steps, so maybe they stay dry, but you're exposed out here. Now, this one is, if I remember rightly, I think it's El Marty, and it's quite a good example, and to be honest, it's probably the right treatment for what is not quite an expressway, but it's getting close to being an expressway. I just wanna mention one piece of research. Uh, a researcher by the name of Zager, way back in 1993, did about the only research I've seen about using grade separation, using footbridges. And he found 95% of pedestrians will use these footbridges or indeed an underpass, provided there's no loss of time compared to just walking straight across the road. But if they work out that it's going to take them 50% longer to go to the uh, footbridge, go up, go across, go down, if they think it's going to be more than 50% longer, almost nobody will use it. And for that reason, I like to think I'm practical. I may not be, but I like to think I am. And I don't want to see Carrick Road authorities wasting money building what we call in the English language, a white elephant. We don't want Carrick Road Authority spending $100,000 to build a facility that no one uses. And if they don't use them, and I've cut and paste this from a, uh, a recent photograph I've received. If the pedestrians don't use the overpasses, what, what happens? Do they not cross the road? Do they stay on the one side of the road forever? Unlikely. They will still want to cross because they still have a market to go to. They still have school to go to. They still have friends that live on the other side of the road. And if they decide that they can cross happily to a median and keep walking, what are you going to do? You as the engineer that was involved in the team that built this overpass, are you going to um, take down the footbridge? Are you going to put up signs telling people you must use the footbridge? Are you going to put fencing on the sides so they cannot get onto the road except the fit ones who can climb the fence? Will you put a fence down the middle, maybe, and on the side? Will you put this concrete barrier all the way along with fences? <laughs> and I'm joking here, will you electrify the fences? My experience tells me that pedestrians, particularly young, fit, males from about 15 to 40, they will jump fences, they will break fences, etc. My experience tells me that we end up in a battle 
and it's a no win battle for anyone, engineers or our customers, the pedestrians. I urge you, think carefully about footbridges and underpasses. They are not always the answer, but if you are thinking of them, will it have an elevator? Will it have ramps for the disabled? Will it be covered for weather? And much of Carrick has some pretty, uh, pretty tough winters. Will it be well lit for personal security? Will there be screens to stop particularly children dropping things onto the road below? And will the piers themselves be roadside hazards? This um, big, big footbridge also serves motorcycles in India. And whilst there are many things to be critical of, like roadside hazards, at least the motorcycles can mix with the pedestrians on this enormous ramped overpass. It has, it has some merits. It has some use. You can have beautiful overpasses, footbridges. In Georgia, you've seen this one shown many times. It's a tourist attraction. It goes from a park on the right, over a beautiful river, over a busy arterial road and into an old part of town. Everything falls into place. And someone had heaps of money to make this a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing uh, footbridge in a wonderful uh, city called Tbilisi. One of my favorite uh, parts of, of uh, all of the world. Oh, we've got Wally hidden away up there too. And when you look at it, it's, uh, it's a tourist attraction in its own right. And I wanted to show you this one. And I don't think we'll see one of these in, uh, within the Carrick region anytime soon. But if you look down from a very tall building, you'll see a footbridge. I showed you this on Thursday. I'm gonna take you down to the level of the bridge. Pedestrians get up and down with escalators. There are some lifts for people in wheelchairs. So you obviously need to have good maintenance. And in a city like Shanghai, I would expect good maintenance. And it's an enormous uh, footbridge, probably more than 100 metres diameter. I've never measured it, but it probably is. And you might have uh, oh, perhaps a thousand people up on that footbridge at any one time. So the structural engineers amongst us will be immediately calculating the dead load and live load and saying, whoa, this is a big structure. Now I show that just to show what wonderful things engineers can achieve. Okay, there are some wonderful footbridges, but please don't, don't jump to them as the first and golden option when it comes to Carrick Highway. And on the other hand, the pedestrian underpasses, these are even less well liked, particularly by women and children because of personal safety. If you're going to have an underpass, it's highly desirable that people can see through it before they enter it, before they enter it, or that it's got attractions within it, like shops, that keep it busy with shoppers and uh, keep it occupied for most of the day, let's say 24 hours a day. It's gotta be well lit. It's gotta have many people in there. Now, across Carrick, you do have many underpasses. They, like in Tbilisi, they do serve the Metro. Sadly, most of them you have to turn at 90 degrees when you get down to go into the facility. This one was on a brand new divided highway in uh, northern India, part of the Golden Quadrilateral. And I could be wrong, but I believe this is a pedestrian underpass. And you can tell that these people and not inclined to use it. And when you look down at what's in it, you say to yourself, who would use it? But keep in mind, a pedestrian underpass, just like a pedestrian footbridge, 
is a form of spatial separation. And it separates the pedestrians from the motor vehicles when they use it. These people didn't see a need to use it and were certainly put off from it. So if you're going to have separation in space, you've got a lot of things to think about. And I'll just quickly flip through a whole array of Carrick photographs. Underpasses in Ulaanbaatar. The other one was uh, Baku. Ulaanbaatar, freezing city, middle of winter, down steps. They tried to help the disabled, probably in wheelchairs, I'm assuming, but it's far too steep for any wheelchair to handle. So that becomes a, a kind of a wasted effort. Once you get down into the underpass, it has doors on it to keep the cold air out. It's an art gallery, that's attractive. But again, you do suffer the problem of stepping into the subway before you know who's in there. So personal safety is still a bit of an issue, particularly for the women and the kids. So if, if you're lucky enough to have this space where you can see through the underpass before you enter it, that's the best of everything. You can decide there's no one in here to threaten me, I'm walking through. Now, this video does not have sound, and I don't think I've shown it last week, but this shows the mechanism of how a vehicle doesn't run over a pedestrian, it runs under them. I'll show that one more time. The pedestrian is, uh, sorry, the car is braking. He's going too fast and he can't wipe off enough speed. He hits the boy around the hips and the legs and he throws the boy uh, 10 meters down the road. Now, the reason I show that is because it shows the terrible dynamics involved in a pedestrian collision. And it's something that kind of sobers us up and keeps, keeps in mind what we're talking about. Now, crossing the road, crossing the road. The other devices, and this is to clarify my answer for, to Laurent, there are two types of mid-block pedestrian signals. These are red, yellow, green signals. The first ones I call pedestrian signals. They are fixed time. The pedestrians cannot place a call. The pedestrian has to stand there and wait for the walk to come up. The second are pedestrian operated signals, POS. And these have got a push button for the pedestrians to push and that records their intention to cross the road. To the motorists, they all look the same. It's just red and yellow and green lanterns. To the pedestrian, they still got walk and don't walk. Some of them may have countdown timers, but the main difference is the ability for the pedestrians to call up their wish to cross the road. Here in Dushanbe, outside a new hospital, through the benevolent uh, help of a British what's the term, a, a person who helps, philanthropist, I think is the term, uh, was the newest set of push button signals where the pedestrians, even at four o'clock in the morning, can come along and push a button and the signals will say, good, we know you're there. You're gonna get the walk in a couple of seconds, just wait, and then the walk comes up and the pedestrians cross. Pedestrian operated signals, are the way that most crossing, uh, what's the word, most of your crossing issues in most of your urban areas can be best addressed. The pedestrians call up their crossing uh, phase when they need it. The rest of the time it is green to the motorist. You end up with, if you have these used consistently across the network, Drivers respect the signals. 
And pedestrians know that when they push the button, they're very quickly going to get their walk phase. These do cost money. These do require the odd bit of maintenance. But these are the way of the present and the future when it comes to pedestrian facilities, not just in Carrick, but across the world. Now, the bottom line, mid-block crossings. I've just got to hope that I'm looking at the right slide here. I'll just go back one. All right. The issue is with mid-block pedestrian signals, you have either a green pedestrian and a red pedestrian facing across the street, or you might have the words walk, don't walk. When the green man is showing, the pedestrians may begin to cross. When it goes to a flashing red man or a flashing green man, different countries have different colors for the flashing. That's the clearance interval. And that really means, and I'm being very particular here, that means the pedestrians can finish crossing if they are on the crossing but they must not commence. They must not step off the footpath if they have not already started. That clearance interval is vital. I'm gonna come back to that in the next few slides. And when the don't walk or the red man is steady and is shining to the pedestrians, they better get off that crossing. They shouldn't be there. So the clearance interval, the flashing time to the pedestrians is really important. And I'm bold enough to say that I think it is severely overlooked across Carrick. Mid-block pedestrian signals with no push buttons rely on a cycle that's based on historical data of traffic volumes, et cetera, et cetera. And approximately every minute, the walk comes up and the pedestrians can cross. The don't walk comes up. It goes back green to the motorist. Another minute later, the whole cycle is repeated. It is independent of pedestrian demand. It is independent of volumes of traffic. And it can lead to problems if you end up with these signals operating 24 hours a day in the middle of the night, when there's only two pedestrians every hour, there's no need to have the signal cycling every minute. And when you do that, but there's no pedestrians crossing, any driver at two or three or four in the morning will get very, very, very frustrated and probably will go through. And once they experience this a few times in a few months or a few years, they will be in the habit of simply driving through a red signal at two or three or four in the morning, regardless. And they won't even look for pedestrians. And once every now and then, you will end up with an almighty tragedy. So basically these fixed time signals, mid block, are quite dangerous and they are certainly ineffective. And if we can fit push buttons, so they only activated when a pedestrian demand is uh, requires it, they can be made much more effective. And in providing that efficiency, they will be better and safer for all. If you go in the middle of the night to flashing yellow, and some of you might tell me you do that, then I'm afraid you are converting that crossing to back to nothing much better than a zebra crossing, where the pedestrian has to be seen by the motorist on the crossing. These are what we call a passive crossing. The two have to see each other. And if you do that, sadly, you are placing everybody at increased risk. But going to the flashing yellow signals is the way engineers compensate for having fixed time signals throughout the rest of the day.
Phil, just before you move on from signals, uh, we've got a yep. question here, but actually I wanted to raise something as well. So I'll allow you just to have a sure. break for a second and have a glass of water. I think Thank another you. key aspect of what you're talking about there, of course, relates to enforcement. Uh, and, uh, and I think in particular, I've been to many countries where there might be a, um, a fixed uh, signal crossing, um, but there might not be uh, proper awareness or acceptance of that by drivers. And it can indeed create at, at sometimes an even more dangerous scenario uh, where you will have people perhaps expecting that cars will yield uh, and walking with confidence, but then that not actually occurring. So I think as well, there's a, a again, a, I think a strong uh, importance overlay there of, of adequate enforcement uh, where, where, where it is required. And of course, also building awareness, which, which again relates to some of those aspects that we talked to right at the start of today's session uh, about the ways in which we need the different parts of the system to work together. So I just wanted to mention that. And I think in particular, that's important where there might be not a strong culture of these type of crossings. Uh, and perhaps when they are introduced, particularly there would be need to be uh, some thought and consideration put into the enforcement and awareness raising activities that would go around those. Where it's in a country or a jurisdiction where there is an existing culture, I think much less needed, uh, but certainly where it's a, a newly adopted uh, intervention, I think it's a, an important consideration. Uh, with that mentioned, uh, just a question here. You mentioned before, uh, Phil, the, um, the countdown uh, intersections, uh, mm -hmm. indicators. Uh, and so Laurent has mentioned that in, in, in his country that they do have those. Uh, and he's wanting to know about your thoughts on the safety of this. And in particular, he mentions that he's seen that when drivers perhaps see that their time is, is starting to go towards zero, so they may have to stop soon, it may actually re result in them um, uh, rushing or speeding to get through that intersection before needing to yield. So. I, I imagine that's one potential element. Uh, there might be others in relation to those countdowns. So perhaps just a bit more thoughts from you on that particular type of uh, intervention. Uh, thanks, uh, Blaze, for that. And thank you, Laurent, for another tough question. Um, in the manual, I do have a subsection that deals with countdown timers. So feel free to, to read that. Uh, I'll ask, everyone out there that's actually got a copy of the manual on their desk or on their computer to put a put a yes in the question and answer. Tell us that you've got, uh, sorry, in the chat box, just say, yes, I've got a manual. Because I hope you're sharing it with your colleagues. I hope you've read parts of it and that you use it as a reference document. So tell us if you're using the CARAC pedestrian safety manual. Chat box. Uh, Laurent, I'm not a big fan of countdown timers. I wish I was, but I keep thinking, and I urge anyone to correct me, I think they are put in in a fixed time system by engineers as a kind of a trade-off to the motorists to say, yeah, we know we've got an inefficient system. You've only got to wait 47 more seconds and you can go. And I think, the countdown timers, which work most conveniently in a fixed time system, they're a, they're a trade-off. I do believe, as you say, that they can encourage unsafe acceleration at the wrong time. Whether they lead to increased crashes or not, I don't recall seeing any study on that. But I'm not a big not a big fan of them, and uh, I think we can do a lot more with that money to really help the pedestrians in particular and come back to the countdown timers when we've solved the big problems. Thank you, Ajmal. You've got uh, your hand up. Uh, is that to say you've got the manual? I'll assume it is unless you put it up again. Um, this side in Ulaanbaatar, I think I mentioned it the other day, it was just a fixed time set of signals, mid block. It was one of five along the airport road. In the space of one year, the police told me 11 pedestrians were killed crossing this road. Maybe not all at signals, admittedly, 
But the story is, I made a few suggestions in a very quick and casual inspection. And I said, it disappoints me that there are no pedestrian push buttons. So the pedestrians can call up their demand. When I went back six months later, the pedestrians, uh, sorry, the police had fitted pedestrian push buttons somehow, magically. And they were raving about them. And they were claiming already, which I think was far too premature, they were claiming a 50% reduction in crashes. Far too premature. But I was thrilled that the police had managed in a short period of time to make them into pedestrian operated signals. So that's good news. Bill, I might just check in and see if Ajmal indeed maybe had a question or, or further comment. Please, please before do. Before we move on. Uh, Ajmal, did you want to uh, ask a question? Please feel free to unmute if you would like to ask or else we will move on. And because of Ajmal, I've put a uh, photograph behind me here on this presentation, which is from one of the back streets of Peshawar. When I spent about a month in Pakistan, quite a few years ago, and it was just around iftar time during Ramadan in October, the year of the big Musafarabad earthquake. Ajmal may remember that. I think you're right, Ajmal was indicating, I think that had the manual. So let's, let's continue. Phil. Let's go. Okay, pedestrian operated signals. Now, I hope you're seeing the difference that I'm trying to bring out here. Pedestrian operated signals have these push buttons, like over here. And the push buttons help the pedestrians to record their intention to cross. The signals create gaps in traffic and they give the pedestrians their own time to cross the road if the drivers comply. So again, as in the safe system uh, states, the drivers, the pedestrians, everyone has to behave and follow the road rules. I think it's fair to say that push button signals are generally liked by pedestrians. You teach your children when you're crossing, you hold their hands when they're little, you tell them to look left and right to make sure all the traffic is stopping. But the walk and don't walk and the signals themselves are easy to understand. And generally, at least in my part of the world, and I think in most others, are pretty well complied with. The uh, signals remain green to the drivers until the pedestrian pushes the button. That might be minutes after the previous call was recorded. It could be hours. It depends on the pedestrian volume. They have a crash reduction factor. These signals will reduce about a quarter of all pedestrian crashes compared to having no crossing. That's what one looks like in uh, my city. Blaze, I'm getting nervous. There's a bit of flickering here. If it fails again after me updating various drivers, I'll be very angry. You can hear me, Blaze? I can hear you, go ahead. Oh no. Can you see the slide? Yes, yes, can he, can see the slide. Look, I had this on all day at a workshop today and it didn't do anything. And now it's gone and blacked out on me and I don't know why. I'm going to have to get out and start again. I'm sorry, Blaze, and sorry, people. Give me one minute, please. Okay, Phil, no you problem. Tell, tell some Australian jokes, thanks, Blaze. Yeah, sure. All right, so apologies, everyone. Just having a couple of technical issues there uh, from Phil. So as he mentioned, he'll be back in just a moment. Uh, though, let me use this opportunity to again remind everybody that we do have our first small work uh, homework um, activity due today, uh, which is uh, the close of business today. Uh, and this is uh, the first piece that was shared with you on Thursday last week. I'll just turn my video on. There I am. Uh, so, yeah, please do ensure that you put that in and Phil will be reviewing those and also um, able to, um, uh, also able to um, provide comment on those 
in upcoming sessions. So just a reminder to do that. Uh, I might ask Pilar again to put into the chat box the email address for submission of those and then we will be able to, uh, you'll have that right information. Whilst we're just waiting for Phil to return, uh, I will just give you a, a brief overview of the upcoming sessions this Thursday, which will begin again starting same time, 3 p.m. 1500 Manila time on Thursday. Again, we'll be looking at non-engineering issues and we will be hearing from Phil with some thoughts uh, from homework assignments, but also we'll be hearing from Dave Cliff from the Global Road Safety Partnership, who will be looking at the role of enforcement in supporting pedestrian safety. We've talked already today about the need for complementary enforcement along with uh, infrastructure interventions. We'll also be hearing from uh, Phil again uh, in relation specifically to disabled pedestrians, which again, he has mentioned today. And also we'll be hearing from Emma McLennan from East, who will be talking about the role of community engagement in reducing pedestrian trauma. So they will be the sessions that will be on on Thursday. And again, really complementing the topics that we've been looking at in relation to infrastructure in the sessions to date. Uh, then we'll be finishing with our final session on Tuesday the 28th, where we will uh, look at some of the broader pedestrian facilities and urban and rural settings. So just a reminder there of those. I can see Phil is back with us. So Phil, warm welcome back. Um, and whilst you are getting that online, uh, it turns out Ajmal does indeed have a question. Uh, so let me again ask Ajmal if you would be like to unmute yourself, Ajmal, and please do go ahead uh, and uh, ask away your question. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Yes. Hi, Am welcome. Audible? Please yes. go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, 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 in the session, we were discussing engineering uh, uh, solutions for the uh, pedestrian crossing. Uh, so uh, but there were uh, mention of uh, pedestrian crossing underpasses uh, uh, in India. Uh, but, uh, but I wanted to uh, share an idea that if uh, uh, we can have uh, 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 under, uh, underpass for the vehicles and overpass for the pedestrians equal to the level of the uh, 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 land. So vehicles from that side go uh, downwards and uh, from the upper side, there will be a level crossing for the pedestrians. So uh, uh, I would uh, uh, I would uh, like to ask the panelists how uh, the uh, uh, how that idea can be uh, uh, used for uh, the purpose of the pedestrian project and and how much it will cost uh, in comparison to overhead bridge. Well. Um... What I'm hearing from you, Ajmal, is the thought of taking the road underneath the area where the pedestrians are crossing the road. Uh, yes, the, the pedestrian have the level crossing and uh, the vehicle would have been going underpass. The normally that's we fine. have in the urban yep. area. Yep, yep, yep. Look, that's, that's a great concept. It has some practical problems. I won't get into drainage and uh, sub, uh, sub underwater, underground drainage and water, water issues, but the uh, pedestrians can step down steps at quite a steep angle. Vehicles, motor cars and trucks and buses have to go at a gentler grade, which means that the distance of that underpass becomes quite long. It therefore, generally requires quite a volume of earth to be moved and in turn it becomes expensive and it can be disruptive in a town or city in Pakistan or in India or indeed anywhere in the world. 
Now, the concept is good, but it's not as practical as some others. What we've seen in particularly in India, and you probably have seen it in parts of South Asia, there are many ramped uh, earth overpasses, flyovers, where the motor vehicles are taken up and through the towns and cities on an elevated road, ramped earth. The pedestrians in those towns face a wall of concrete, but they do have a few spots which are openings, which are subways, so they can cross at the road level or sorry, at the, at the normal earth level, but they still have some restrictions on just how they can cross. The vehicles go above them. So that's the concept you've proposed, except in reverse, that the cars are up above, you're proposing the cars below. If you can get the money, wonderful idea, but expensive. So uh, you are right. Uh, that would be uh, the reciprocate. Uh, your idea is good, I, I think. That will, how much... Uh, that would be uh, in terms of uh, economics. How would it would be costing as compared to the under under underpass? You mean the ramped earth ones? Let me yes, see. Yes, ramp uh, Look, I, I it's always easier to build the road up than it is to go down. Generally, don't ask please for a cost from me. Uh, I'm totally out of touch with the cost, particularly in other countries, but. I'll try to get a couple of photographs of some ramped earth roadways in India and show them either Thursday or next Tuesday, just for everybody to know what I'm talking about. They're not the total answer. Please don't think I'm a big fan of them, but in answer to your question, um, it, it's kind of, it shows what can be done. At the end so of the day, let me put it to you, and I've said this to some of your engineering colleagues in Punjab, and I've said it to the people in Sindh also, that they need to traffic calm the traffic on the highways as they enter the towns, and they need to provide refuge islands for the pedestrians to cross with slow speed traffic. I'm not sure the engineers have been prepared to accept that advice just yet, but I keep putting it to them. And I think you will end up with better, more livable towns that way than if you take the traffic under or elevated. If you can bypass the town altogether, wonderful, but uh, time will tell. Thank you, Ajmal, for the question. And for others, don't hesitate to either put it in the chat or raise your hand and we will try to incorporate further questions but with that phil and an eye on time let, let you continue yeah thank, thank you, you, so thank you so much again. yeah thanks ajmal thank you and i apologize i did upgrade my computer in the last few days i upgraded drivers and things and it still plays up only with you guys not for the other workshop uh push button detectors like this in turkey are the most common form of activation for pedestrians and that's it's very basic and very useful. Having consistent push buttons is desirable so that pedestrians can see them, they know how to operate them, they know where to find them. And those examples I've put in that slide, I won't spend time on because of time constraints. They're just the so-called standard for uh, push button signals here in Victoria. They can be all sorts of types, but the reason I'm a supporter of these on the right is because they help the visually impaired. And the visually uh, impaired need advice through audio tactile devices to get to the signals and to be able to find the push button and to push it. It has got a very big button compared to a little one in Tbilisi. This one has got a call record button. It will tell the visually capable pedestrian that their call is recorded. This one, you've got to live in hope. After you push it, you hope the machine is doing what it has to do. So 
keep in mind when you do move your ministry onto push button signals, have good big call buttons. Remind your customers that they have had their call recorded. Orientate this arrow and you might want to have a tactile arrow that vibrates in the walk and don't walk at different speeds. And always position your buttons in the same position at the same height with all of your crossings. And I won't spend more time on that. That's just a diagram straight out of the manual. Now, I'm a supporter of pedestrian operated signals. I think you know that. There are different variations and they all have the names of birds or gods. Pelican crossings, puffin crossings, toucan crossings, and a Pegasus crossing. You really don't need to know much about these, except I do urge you to take an interest in the Puffin crossing. Pelican has a flashing yellow phase, which operates for drivers. It operates after a set time, generally after a period when most of the pedestrians have crossed the road. This is what the driver sees. He or she is facing a red. When the pedestrians have generally gone, it will open up to a flashing yellow and then green. When it's flashing yellow, pedestrians, the drivers, the drivers can proceed provided they've given way to the pedestrians. And then it will close again. When the next pedestrian comes along a minute, two minutes, five minutes, an hour later and pushes the button. But importantly, this famous puffin crossing, and I don't have time to ask you what puffin means, so I'll tell you. It stands for pedestrian user-friendly intelligent crossing, puff in. In English, I can only guess what it is in, in Russian. I don't know if it works in Russian. So when you walk up to the front door of a big department store or supermarket, there's a detector and it knows there's someone coming towards it. It doesn't know your name, but it knows there's a human coming towards it or it might be a, another animal. And it will detect that person and will open the doors. This crossing has a detector here, another one here, a different one, but same principles here. And they look exactly the same as every other set of pedestrian operated signals. That's good, consistent. Puffin crossings have been shown to reduce vehicle delays, vehicle delays by 40%. They help the mobility impaired, the elderly, the slow moving pedestrians. They've got a good proven crash reduction factor. Now, when your grandmother carrying a heavy load from the market and being very slow in her footsteps, steps onto a puffin crossing, she's pushed the button, the walk has come up. She has stepped onto the road, but she's very slow to cross the road. She gets two thirds of the way across and the signals have ended their clearance time. They've given a lot of clearance time, but it's time to open up to the motorists. But your grandmother is still walking slowly across the road. The detector knows that there is still someone on the crossing and it will increase the clearance time just for that phase. It will increase the clearance time up to a preset maximum. Your grandmother hopefully will get to the curb before the crossing opens up to the traffic. That's what a puffin crossing does. The detector detects the slow moving pedestrian and increases the clearance time. And I keep stressing the importance of clearance times at all of your signals for safety. And because of that, because most pedestrians are not as slow as our hypothetical grandmother, most pedestrians hop, skip and jump and they're out of the way very quickly. Engineers have to provide for the average pedestrian, which is around 1.2 meters per second walking speed. 
but most pedestrians are a bit faster than that. So having the drivers sit there facing a red signal with no more pedestrians to cross is wasteful. The puppins can reduce that waste, they can reduce that delay, and they reduce it by 40%. This is a puffin outside one of my grandson's schools. Simple push button signals outside on a, an arterial road here in Melbourne on a wet day. There's the detector somewhere up above this, a red man saying, do not walk. A green would say, yes, you can, oh no. You there, Blaze? Yes, I'm here, Phil, can you hear me? Uh, this has become very embarrassing. It's blacked out on me again, and I don't so, have an alternative computer. So, Phil, I might suggest that I could perhaps um, put the, the slides up and then, uh, but will you be able to see what I have put up? I'll have to get out and get back into it. Please try that. I, I, it's never collapsed this quickly before. So I'll, uh, I'll try it that way. I'll get out now. Give me another minute. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Apologies again, all. So again, apologies for some technical issues. I'm now going to share my screen with you so that we can hopefully avoid these issues, bear with me here just for a moment. And I'm sharing here just for that those that is there for everyone to see. There I am back on the screen. So again, everyone, apologies. We're obviously having some technical issues here today and uh, we will hopefully be able to ensure that we can have the rest of the session uh, relatively smooth. Uh, and I will also perhaps suggest that we will use some of the time in the next session to ensure that we don't miss any of the content from today's session, uh, given our time constraints. Uh, so we will, uh, perhaps um, suggest that we would do that and uh, so that we don't uh, go over time too much today, but still ensure that we have the requisite um, content that is covered uh, on this important on these important topics for the um, so, so that you have that and you don't miss out on that particular content. So we will uh, perhaps ensure that we do that. Um, and, uh, and, and make sure that that's actually, actually uh, available to you uh, at that time. So I see now that Phil has rejoined our session and hopeful that his technical issues have uh, come back. There you are, Phil. Phil, I was just mentioning that what we might do is ensure that we juggle around a little the agenda for Thursday and we might just in cover off what we might not be able to have in time today. Uh, sure. on, on Thursday session, um, and that's that's no problem, easily done. Um, so I'll let's let's just ensure that we'll do that in between now and Thursday. Let's get sure. as much content as we can done today. Uh, yep. But but I was just I was just uh, uh, letting <laughs> people know we certainly won't have a situation where they're missing out on any content. Nope. Okay, so with that, I will um, share my slides here, Phil. Let's hope that works, and you just let me know next slide whenever you're ready. Next, thanks, Blaze. Apologies again. Uh, that's a detector for a puffin crossing. Thanks, Blaze. The other less common uh, device allows both cyclists and pedestrians to cross at the same time. It's called Toucan Cross. And as you can see, there is a uh, both a walking man and a cyclist symbol there. So that's a novelty for situations where you want both to cross, thanks. And this is a Pegasus crossing. I think I only know of one of these in Victoria, my state. And it's normally where you have equestrians, people on horses who wish to ride across the road without dismounting. Push button, of course, is mounted much higher than normally push button signals. Thanks, Blaze. Now, we've spoken of active and passive right back at the start of this session. 
Active facilities require the driver to, require, to, to comply with a red signal, regardless of whether there's any pedestrians on the crossing or not. If there is a red signal, drivers must stop. For that, your job as an engineer is to make sure the signals are very conspicuous, that the people, the drivers can see the signals. Passive facilities, on the other hand, require drivers to see the pedestrian on the crossing and to give way. In this case, your job as an engineer is to maximize sight lines to and from the pedestrian to make sure they are really good. Civil works like curb extensions and pedestrian refuges are helpful at both of these facilities. Passive time devices, time separation devices are zebra crossings and maybe a school crossing. Thanks, Blaise. A zebra crossing gives time for the pedestrians to cross. That's a little cartoon from somewhere else. Thanks, Blaise. And they provide separation in time. They are a passive form of device and the driver has to see the pedestrians in order to know whether to give way or not. Thanks, Blaise. Placing any crossing on a hump is going to be safer than no hump. Our studies here in Australia show that zebra crossings like this one in the back streets of Bishkek will reduce crashes, casualty crashes by 73%. So three out of four crashes. Thanks, Blaise. And the crossing that I showed very quickly on Thursday was a part-time crossing. And the reason I put this up is to get you as innovative people to think about devices that might be very cheap, operate for an hour in the morning, hour in the afternoon, possibly at schools, kindergartens or certain places, only when people are going en masse at a given short period of time. Thanks, Blaise. And they operate they have legal status only when there is a flag displayed. Now you might have a rotating disc on the top or you might do anything you wish, but the fundamentals, low cost, clearly within the road rules, simple to use when it's not meant to operate, it falls back to being a part of the road system. And our experience here in Australia and Blaze, I'm sure, has been brought up and he's bringing his kids up with school crossings all around. These are well respected by drivers and they have an excellent safety record. They may or may not have adult supervision. That's a separate little category. Thanks, Blaze. Uh, I hope this video works for you, Blaze. If people don't like looking at bad videos, turn away now. Next one, thanks Blaze, if you can make this one work. <laughs> Sorry, I was, we've sold you a pup, I think. Down the, go below the picture. Nothing's doing it, is it? Okay, might have, next to, show, one. Might have to show it on Thursday. Yeah, we will. Now, Moving on to a topic that traffic signals are all over the Carrick uh, region. This is a big uh, intersection in the western part of China. These signalised intersections offer many wonderful opportunities to help your pedestrians. And too often we don't help them enough. So keep these basic, uh, basic rules in mind. Next thanks Blaze. We have got three main things. There is signal hardware. The hardware should always have pedestrian displays. Sometimes they don't. The pedestrians have to guess. They should have audio tactile pedestrian push buttons. So the pedestrians can call up their phase, even if there's no, pedest uh, no motor vehicles around. And you must make sure that all of the drivers can see the pedestrians. So you've got to have it open, clear of the 
instructions. The second thing is, is the signal phasing, the software. So you've got the hardware, what people see, and you've got the software, which is ticking away underneath. We normally run the pedestrians in parallel with the moving traffic. Not always, but generally. And for this, we need to give really long clearance time, which needs to be based on the width of the road and a walking speed of 1.2 meters per second. Now keep that in mind because my experience in many of your cities is that pedestrians get a long walk time, but the walk almost immediately becomes a red do not cross signal. And pedestrians like your hypothetical grandmother carrying a load of oranges can be left stranded in the middle. So the clearance time, which is often ignored in Carrick is very important. And I'll show a picture in a moment, never, ever, ever, run a pedestrian phase across a turn arrow. And the third thing to think about are the civil works at the intersection. We've got the hardware, the software, and the civil works. Things like curb ramps, uh, tactile tiles for helping the visually impaired. We have curb extensions, street lighting, and all weather footpaths. These are all good things. They're low tech and they're very helpful. Thanks, Blaise. This is the signal hardware. You need signals, whether they're down at driver level or up above or even higher than that on a mast arm. And we must provide pedestrian signals. We must show the pedestrian across the road when to cross, when not to start crossing, and when they must be totally off the crossing. We need audio tactile push buttons. They are for the sight impaired, who we should be always thinking about. And we need to ensure that the conflicting drivers from who are turning into the road, they have a good opportunity to see the pedestrians. Thanks, Blaise. As a general rule, make sure we give adequate clearance time. As I said before, a road width might be 16 meters, uh, a walking speed of 1.2 meter per second. We have to work on the basis that someone has legally and correctly just stepped onto the crossing to walk across the road as the walk signal drops away and it becomes the don't walk the clearance time. So if you've got a 16 metre wide carriageway, you need to divide that by 1.2 metres per second, and my arithmetic's not so good, but that's around about, uh, what, 12, 12 seconds or something. So we need to provide a good, adequate clearance time. And as I said before, we never ever run a pedestrian phase across a turn arrow. Thanks, Blaze. The next photograph explains why. Now, any of you, uh, if anyone's there from Ulaanbaatar, please put your hand up. But this is an intersection in your city. And when you see an arrow, that tells you you can turn and you won't have any conflicts. Now, I'm not quite sure what this big car is doing here. So take him out of the line of sight. Uh, but you've got two vehicles turning right, a black one and a silver one. And they are thinking, I can turn right. No one is going to obstruct me. I have right of way. But these pedestrians, they've got a similar message telling them, I can now walk. I have got the walk signal. That walk signal is in contradiction to the right turn arrows. Thanks, Blaze. A big no-no for any signal engineer. Third point, the civil works. And we'll talk more about that later. And if we don't get to it today, it will come up on Thursday, if there is time, or Tuesday next week, if there has to be. 
And if this computer continues to be a nuisance, it'll be the, <laughs> the following day after that. Civil works involve basically concrete, curbing, nice gentle ramps for parents with pushers, for people in wheelchairs to go down from a footpath, down onto the road, cross the road, back up again. Curb extensions. A funny thing called small corner radii. In other words, keeping the radii of the corner of, of the intersections as small as practical to minimize the crossing distance of the pedestrian. And making sure there's no obstructions on the footpaths, all very important. Thanks, Blaze. Uh, skip on to the next one, thanks. Um, skip on again, we'll keep skipping on. Fully controlled signals are wonderful. If you're going to have fully controlled signals, um, these provide very clear guidance to the motorist and they can give priority to parallel pedestrian movements as well, as well as reducing the risks of left turn against collisions. Thanks, Blaze. I've stressed the importance of the clearance time for pedestrians and I please go on to the next one, Blaze, because the next one is a, uh, it's a diagram. It takes a moment or two to understand, but it's a diagram that uh, basically explains the signal phasing. And I can't wave my cursor at it, but it means that the pedestrian interval, which is the top colored line, that's it. And the vehicle phasing, which is the bottom colored line, you can see the two sections of green. The green to the pedestrians is the walk time. And that's relatively short. The green to the motorist is longer. But the two of them include a walk time to the pedestrians and a clearance time. Because the pedestrians take longer to cross the road than what the cars do going through the intersection. So I'd urge you to have a think about this diagram in the manual at your leisure and just take note of the relative size of the clearance time for the pedestrian. And there are two clearance times. One of them leads up to the solid red, if your country flashes the red man, and one of them is the solid red. So clearance time can easily be much longer than the walk time. It can be very important. It is very important. Thanks, Blaze. There are different ways of calculating pedestrian clearance times. This is an easy one and I'll let you work that out. Um, it's based on a walking speed, an average pedestrian speed of 1.2 meters per second. It's not rocket science. Thanks, Blaze. And one of the messages that I make very strongly in that uh, manual, good clearance times for pedestrians at signals, whether they are intersection signals or pedestrian operated signals at mid block. Very important. Thanks, Blaze. So there's lots of things that can assist pedestrians at signalized intersections, but we'll, we'll push on. We've covered most of those in one way or another. We'll go on through a few of the word slides now. And uh, the next one is a photograph of a signalized intersection here in Melbourne. So we're driving on the other side of the road to many of your countries. The things to note, the curbing is a semi-mountable curbing. It's not the big curb stones that Carrick tends to have. There are dropped curbs for the curb ramps, the pram crossings as we call them. There are tactiles for the visually impaired in the concrete. There are push buttons. There is good street lighting overhead. 
the markings are still a bit ad hoc because the final uh, layer of asphalt had not been placed down. But all in all, you had a facility which was encouraging and reasonably positive for the uh, pedestrian. Thanks, Blaze. We'll skip the right turn on red, and I'll let you read that in the manual. And I'll say that I'm not a big fan of right turn on red because as this particular slide shows, various studies in the US where right turn on red started showed that pedestrians were placed at added risk and the crashes involving pedestrians went up by anything between about 14% up to 40 and 50%. So, if you are in a country where you have right turn on red, I urge you to think critically about the value of it and to think about maybe other options. Thanks, Blaze. And the other options are to consider banning all of right turn on red, which might put you at conflict with the traffic engineers that want to keep vehicles moving. Another option is to ban right turn on red where you have high volumes of pedestrians conflicting with high numbers of vehicles. Another option is at the signals to put in green right turn arrows that permit the vehicles to turn only when the opposing pedestrian phase is not called. There's a few negatives in all of that or to put in red right turn arrows to control turns, which are activated when the pedestrian phase is called. And if you have room, build a right turn slip lane. Thanks, Blaze. Walking along the road. Thanks, Blaze. Many things to think of. Thanks, Blaze. Children, people waiting to be picked up. Thanks, Blaze. We need separate footways if you can build them. The World Bank keeps saying it's important to give separate all weather footpaths away from the road, even in rural areas. And if you can do that, great. Thanks, Blaze. Something like that, it's a semi-rural, it's a village, it's in Tajikistan. It's wonderful, nice shady, interesting environment for the kids to walk through. Thanks, Blaze. <clears throat> but generally, we don't have that luxury. And particularly in the more rural areas, we do not have that luxury. So paved shoulders, as I say here, and I'll let you read that, are wonderful. Thanks, Blaze. These little kids going home from school in Indonesia enjoy walking on a brand new concrete paved shoulder. It keeps their feet dry in the wet season. Thanks, Blaze. And little girls also in Indonesia walking home on a paved shoulder. Thanks, Blaze. And if you're going to pave the shoulder, think about helping the motorist as well by putting in a tactile edge line. <laughs> if the wheels travel over it. <laughs> and this will also alert the, uh, the pedestrians down the road that there is a vehicle that might be getting a little close to them. So it helps the pedestrians, but it also helps run off the road crashes. Blaze, thanks. The small scale civil works that I spoke of, um, these don't give any priority to the pedestrian. They're low tech. Some people don't even know that the council or the ministry or the road authority has actually built them. But these things can be really helpful. They are minor civil works like refuges and curb extensions. They can include traffic calm streets and they can help the pedestrians to cross a road whilst not giving those pedestrians any legal priority over the motor vehicle. They don't give time separation, okay, but they are useful. Now, I hope Laurent is making notes because all of this is all part of my big answer to Laurent from about one hour ago. Thanks, uh, Blaise. 
those are the things that are included. Uh, I'll keep moving on quickly. Thanks, Blaine's. I may not finish today, but we'll we'll wrap up a certain amount. Now, footpaths like this are wonderful. They're good places for people to wander, to shop, to meet friends. You heard on the very first day of this um, workshop about movement and place, about how roads the movement of people, but they are also a place where people want to meet, shop, eat, drink, congregate. This one in Tbilisi, uh, I think it's on Rosta Valley Avenue, is a wonderful example of a good footpath. Thanks, Blaise. Another footpath in Tajikistan, equally as good, perhaps a bit hot in the summertime, but good. Thanks, Blaise. And an incredibly wide one in Saudi Arabia that I took a month ago that I couldn't help but put in. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say about it, except almost excessively wide, but I don't know that you can ever have a footpath that's excessively wide. Thanks, Blaise. If you are going to have good footpaths, make sure you have good curb ramps to funnel pedestrians to a given point for them to cross the road at right angles. Thanks, boys. I think uh, curb ramps like this are such a low tech treatment that they are taken for granted, but they are really useful. Thanks, Blaze. The next photograph explains them better. The path comes to the curb and the curb is not a big curb stone, it's just ramped down to nothing. Drainage is not an issue. The water might go up at a bit in an extreme heavy downpour, but it rarely uh, creates problems for anyone. Thanks, Blaze. You must have an anti-slip surface, maximum slope of uh, sort of a one to eight, and you orientate these curb ramps at right angles to the road. Thanks, Blaze. Here's another example. And I guess if you're intending on doing this type of small scale civil work, you need to have contractors who have the machinery and the skills to do it. If you're constantly putting in curb stones, there's a fair chance your contractors won't have the background to be able to have nice gentle curbs where people in wheelchairs, mothers and parents with prams can go through without big bumps and big dislocations. Thanks, uh, Blaze. And another example, the engineers have tried hard to make something which is a ramp down to ground level, but they've failed because it's too steep. So that one, not such a good idea. There are easier and gentler ways and less complex ways. Thanks, Blaze. Pedestrian refuges. I'm a supporter of pedestrian refuges. They will reduce pedestrian delays by 90%. They may be used together with push button signals and other time separation facilities. They've got to be big enough to store the number of pedestrians you expect, as well as any traffic signs that you need to put on them for traffic reasons. Thanks, Blaze. The next one shows a photograph in England of a small pair of pedestrian refuges, one in the foreground, another one 40 metres beyond. The space in between can be used by pedestrians or vehicles, but it's kind of a safe space. But the most pedestrians will cross to where the refuge island is, and you'll notice again, a small curbing and a cut through walkway for the pedestrians. Thanks, Blaze. <clears throat> we'll skip through that one. And we'll show you the next one, which is a photograph. The ideal pedestrian refuge should be at least two meters wide. And if you have a wide enough road, a little wider does not hurt. It helps to store parents with prams, cyclists. 
mother and child in this case, crossing an arterial road here in Melbourne, and I've flipped it over for Carrack drivers. Thanks, Blaze. Now we're getting to the end of the time and we still got slides yes. to go. What, what Phil, do we do? Yeah, Phil, what I was going to suggest, I, I noted that this uh, slight change now in, in terms of the, the next kind of phase is coming. I might suggest that we could now just jump over to the homework uh, guidance now. And then we do have some time at the start of the session on Thursday where we could catch up on these last uh, content slides, if you like, uh, and then have those at the start of next session. But that means that we still now have just a few minutes to talk to the homework, second homework sure. assignment. Sure. How does that sound? I, I think that's very prudent. I think it's a wise move. Okay, so I'll and, just uh, switch through these and I'll sure. get to that slide, which is here. Yep. And, and I'll apologise again for the hiccup, but I hope everyone is following us. I hope everyone is appreciating the fact that uh, pedestrians are important and there are different ways of helping them. Now, some of you will know this black spot. Some of you, only a couple, have been on workshops with me and we've used this example before. It's one of the most real black spots that we know of in Carrick that involve pedestrians. I understand that it involved four fatalities and 14 crashes. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to look at these photographs and to look at the collision diagram that I'm giving you and the crash factor matrix. And imagine you are the road safety engineer responsible for making this section of road safer for the users. Thanks, Blaise. So this is homework number two. This is treating a pedestrian black spot. Your homework number one was road safety audit. This is homework number two. And Pillar is going to share the link to this presentation below. So you can see what you've missed out on. But in this link is the, the homework. It's the slide you are looking at now. It's a simple job I'm asking but it's, uh, it's, it requires a lot of experience. And for some of you, you might, you might uh, struggle to come up with options. That's all right. It's for learning, it's for learning. And we're looking for a one page report on recommendations to fix up the black spot. Thanks, Blaze. It's on this road, which is called Simone Avenue. It's in the capital city of Tajikistan, which you all know is Dushanbe. Thanks, Blaze. And the interesting thing, where that red arrow was, sorry, I was a bit quick there. There is a subway. There is an underpass. So this is a, let's say, 200 metre length black spot, black length. Pedestrians are heavily involved mostly at night time. So keep looking for the patterns in crashes and keep remembering somewhere just under here, there's already a subway. Thanks, Blo. Now, I've come away from a workshop here in Melbourne today where we've presented about crash factor matrices. Every one of these columns is a crash, 14 crashes. And each row gives certain details, the date, the day of week, the time of day, the light condition. Many of these were dark or dusk times. Many of them involved a car striking a pedestrian. Not all, but most. And the direction is given. Look for patterns. Think as a detective, try to find what it is in the environment that's leading to the crashes. Thanks, Blaze. This is my little hand-drawn collision diagram. This is what road safety engineers do when they are investigating black spots. We rely heavily on good 
accurate police crash data. And I'll say this to Ajmal and to his colleagues and to all the police across Carrick, please gather crash data and please share it with the Ministry of Transport because we need to know the extent of the problem in the country all the way down to given black spots. And engineers, if they have this data, can come along and apply their expertise to reduce crashes in the future. In other words, engineers can help the police to have less work to do next year and the year after. So the numbers in red, they match up to the crash number back on the previous slide. And pedestrians are crossing both sides. There are bus stops on both sides. There are bus lanes on both sides of the road. And it's a six lane road. Thanks, Sir Blaze. It's a big wide arterial, Simone Avenue. So ask yourself, if it's late at night and you're wanting to cross there, what are you going to do? Thanks, Blaze. There's a few photos here, different times of day, um, different days. Thanks, Blaze. It is a 60 kilometer per hour speed limit. But I think you could imagine after hours, speeds might be higher. People don't use the subway. There is a subway within about 20, 30 meters of where they're crossing. Thanks, Blaze. There are signals further on, but quite a distance. I wouldn't walk to use the signals, but uh, it's, that's another part of the equation. Thanks, Blaze. Thank you. So, we have pedestrians who take the risk of standing on a pair of white lines, mothers and daughters, school kids. Uh, if they're struck, these vehicles are probably doing close to 60 kilometers per hour now, and a bit further on, they'll be doing 70. Thanks, Blaze. And right underneath, there is a pedestrian underpass, which was built well, I'm guessing, I'm guessing 40 years ago. It's a big wide open underpass and I'm going to show it to you in a moment. Thanks, please. There it is there. Plenty of steps leading down from the road and even more steps leading into the subway. If you are in a wheelchair, you can't use it. Thanks, please. And it's not a bad underpass, to be honest. Not bad at all. But I have found out since putting even this presentation together, I was speaking to one of the speakers who will talk with you on Thursday. She told me that until recently, there were big gates on this subway that locked the subway at night. I did not know that. And these gates were to keep undesirable people out and to keep the subway clean. So there were obviously some anti-social issues involved. Thanks, Blaze. In the uh, pedestrian safety manual, there is an appendix. And in that appendix, there is a thing called um, crash reduction factors. And they say that for any given pedestrian treatment, there is an expectation, and these are based on admittedly foreign studies. They are based on how effective different treatments are at reducing pedestrian crashes. You might want to look at those and decide which ones you want to pick and put into your recommendations. Thanks, Blaze. Noting, of course, and that's the Russian equivalent of the past slide, noting, of course, that the issue is your face. Do you want to do nothing? Do you want to put fencing in to direct people to use the subway? Thanks, Blaze. Do you wish to use ramps, construct ramps to help disabled people to use the subway? Some of you might want to demolish the subway and uh, maybe build a footbridge. 
some will, oh, heaven forbid, want to put in a zebra crossing. Some might want to put in pedestrian operated signals, maybe a puffin. Some of you might have some brand new idea that no one has thought of before, and I sincerely hope that happens. Just remember in this homework, you are the engineer who can recommend actions that can save lives. And by engineer, I mean police as well, Edgemail. It's anybody on this workshop. Thanks, uh, Blaine. So for homework two, keep in mind those photographs, look at the crash data and think, what can we do to help these pedestrians get across the road safer? A one page report written in Microsoft Word sent to me at my email address so I can translate it. If it's in Russian, I can simply Google Translate and next uh, Tuesday, if you get it to me by Sunday night, we will give you a summary response on Tuesday. Thanks, Blaine. And I was going to tell you the number of wallies tonight, but we might save that for a special treat because I know we lost some at the end. <laughs> it's been a bad day. <laughs> That's right. We'll uh, we'll we'll go again on uh, on Thursday. Uh, but I have one uh, answer here, certainly from what we saw in the slides earlier, uh, which is from uh, Mir Hamid, who is in seven. Uh, that could well have been right in terms of the slides on your deck, uh, in terms of then what we uh, that I took over. So in fact, I'm going to award the prize to uh, Mir Hamid at this stage. <laughs> can, can I uh, say? But, uh, Mohammed's a pretty bright young guy and he's been very close to the mark in previous workshops and he's, I think he's probably right tonight as well. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. So uh, let me just then uh, give a, a reminder again that the second piece of homework, which is that one page black spot report is due by close of business Sunday, this Sunday, which is the 26th of June, so Phil can get responses back in the final of our modules uh, for this session on the following Tuesday. And again, a reminder that the current, the first piece of homework is due by the end of today to the email address uh, and uh, that has been posted previously, Phil's email address. And um, we will ensure to have some feedback on that on Thursday. So with that, let me uh, remind you that we will be back here same time Thursday, 1500, 3 p.m. Manila time, where we'll move firstly to some of the few slides that we didn't get to today. And again, apologies for a few technical issues, but we will ensure to cover that content at the start of next session. And then we will move into some of those sessions that I mentioned uh, during one of our breaks, where we will look at some of the non engineering issues in relation to safe pedestrians. So relevant also in relation to some of the comments and questions we've had about how we can ensure that behavior gets addressed along with the engineering when it comes to drivers and pedestrians. So that will be then on Thursday, again, same time. So with that, again, huge thanks to you all for your time uh, and uh, your patience again with a couple of technical issues, but great that we got through the vast majority of content. We will ensure that we will get the rest of it done on Thursday. Thanks so much, Phil and the team, and we will see you Thursday. Have a wonderful, afternoon and evening to all. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. See you soon. Hope the, hope the computer keeps holding on. <laughs>